I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by Professor David Feldman, who's the uh, Rouse Ball Professor of English Law at the University of Cambridge. Hello. Dave, David, could you um, introduce us to your field of expertise and tell us a little bit about uh, how it might be important in the run-up to the referendum? Well, I'm, a, I'm a constitutional lawyer and a public lawyer generally, and um, I also have an interest in human rights and civil liberties. Uh, and the main significance of the referendum for my field is the way in which a decision one way or the other, and indeed the decision to have the referendum at all, has affected constitutional principles, um, including the idea of representative government, the idea that important decisions about the direction of the country are taken not by us, but by the people we elect to make those sorts of decisions on our behalf, um, and on the uh, so-called uh, legislative sovereignty of, of Parliament, um, and also on um, the way in which government is carried on. Cabinet government, the idea of government as, uh, as a collective activity with uh, common responsibility um, to the House of Commons and to a lesser extent the House of Lords. I think all of those are affected by the way in which the referendum has been set up and the possible implications of, a, uh, uh, of the result. Okay, so what are the possible implications of, for instance, uh, a leave vote on our, uh, the way we practice democracy in this country? Well, the first uh, point to note is that we don't know the answer to that mm -hmm. because um, we've never uh, in the past had a referendum um, in which there's been a result which has gone contrary to the expressed view of the leader of our government, uh, our national government. And the um, possibilities that might arise if, if that were to happen would be extremely uh, uncertain. First of all, um, we would presumably have the question, or it may only be a theoretical question, whether the government was prepared to accept and act on the decision expressed through the referendum. Of course, the referendum is non-binding, and um, it, 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 if it were to become binding, then it would be a serious restriction of what we previously thought of as parliamentary sovereignty, the power of our um, the representatives in Parliament to decide uh, and legislate for important matters of, of public policy. Um, it would also cause problems for cabinet government itself because the cabinet is usually seen as a, a unit. We expect collective responsibility and, and that's been relaxed for the period of the campaign. But it would be extremely awkward if, let's say, there were an exit vote, Mr Cameron decided to stay uh, on as Prime Minister um, uh, and uh, decided also to uh, accept the uh, need to negotiate towards an, an exit, but he presumably wouldn't be uh, willing to do that. So we'd have a situation where within Cabinet there'd be a continuing division and a, a known division of, of opinion. It may even be possible that the, the, the job would be delegated to a, a cross-party group, because of course the cabinet at the moment is single party, a cross-party group outside the cabinet. And that would be revolutionary to have people outside the cabinet representing the crown in negotiations on the international plane. So that would be setting a new precedent? It would be a new precedent, and who knows where it would go. Is there, there's, there's no historical background by which uh, we could inform ourselves as to how that would work? No. Um, for differences within Cabinet, we have, for example, the agreement between the um, uh, Conservative and Lib, Lib Dem coalition partners between 2010 and 2015, where they agreed in advance which topics would be subject to um, collective responsibility and which would be accepted from uh, collective responsibility so that the Lib Dems could pursue their separate um, uh, agenda. Um, that might happen, but the, the whether it would work and how it would work within a single party, uh, I don't know. So how do you 
to see the process of leaving actually panning out, uh, you know, in the event of a, a vote to leave next week? Well, there would have to be negotiations. Um, the, the process could go on for some considerable time. Um, the framework for the negotiations would be set once the starting pistol is fired by um, Article 50 on the Treaty uh, on European Union. And uh, Article 50 um, requires negotiations among the member states um, and a, a solution to be negotiated um, and concluded by the Union um, through its Council acting by qualified majority voting. But the UK wouldn't be part of the Council for this purpose. So we'd be in the position of outsiders negotiating with the insiders and then the insiders would have to produce a, um, a, a qualified majority vote for whatever uh, solution was eventually negotiated. Inclu that would have to include the um, arrangements for any continuing trade relationship. So you'd have uh, a problem for the negotiators, first of all, by, by having to deal with the, um, the, the EU authorities, but also having to keep the um, domestic um, government and, and parliament on side as the process was continuing. Um, we know what the procedure would be for um, deciding whether the negotiated settlement was um, satisfactory from an EU perspective. We don't yet know what the procedure would be for deciding that from a UK perspective. Um, it, it would be a treaty matter. Um, it would require quite possibly um, a further referendum um, in the UK to um, approve the uh, treaty before legislation could be implemented or indeed um, the, the treaty could be ratified on behalf of the Crown. Okay, so there's a significant amount of um, negotiation to take place Negotiations take place and then when it comes to deciding whether to ratify uh, the new treaty, um, you would, I think, probably be making up the procedures as you went along to some extent. And then you'll have to get the relevant legislation through the two Houses of Parliament, um, which may or may not be easy. Well, we've already seen a significant amount of d disagreement from both, well, or from all major parties, haven't we? So, yes. Um, getting agreement on the format of the legislation is going to be very painful. Yes. And it could be a knife-edge piece of political uh, negotiation, getting it through the, the Commons and, and the Lords. Which is being undertaken in an environment whereby uh, there's been major splits in the party that has yeah. the majority in the House of Commons. It would be a cross-party arrangement, whatever happens, I think. Sure. So, great challenges to our constitutional system. So, what's the one key fact or message that you would like, that you feel should be better communicated in the run-up to the referendum? Well, we've... <laughs> we've seen across the board uh, um, that the, the big facts which people are either not willing to communicate or not willing to accept when it is communicated is the sheer level of uncertainty on all these fronts. Um, but it is true of the constitutional setup as it is of, of the economy and trade and all those other things, immigration. Um, and if I can give you just one example of, of the difficulty. Um, we've heard about um, how different parties are claiming that a particular level of um, a proportion of legislation in this country actually stems from the EU. What isn't generally understood um, or discussed, I think, are first of all that the uh, amount of 
legislation simply can't be counted because you can't artificially go through and say, well, there are so many articles on this, so many sections on that, so many statutes on the other. It's all much more mixed up together and, and EU law and UK law march side by side in, 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 in this um, area. But also, it's not at all clear what's meant when people say that Parliament uh, would be sovereign if we uh, withdrew, because of course one of the problems is we don't know whether Parliament would have to continue to accept that the EU could legislate for us notwithstanding parliamentary disapproval. Um, if we entered into, let's say, a, a, a trade arrangement, access to the single market, which required us to continue to give effect to EU law relating to the single market, and that's a very large area of EU law. Okay. So um, it, it is not the case that we are likely to find suddenly that we are an EU law-free zone if we came out. Um, even if we want it to be, you will need to go through an immensely complicated process of unpicking all the different bits of EU law and then deciding by some massive law reform review process which bits you wanted to keep, which bits you wanted to change and which bits you wanted to repeal or just get rid of. And that would keep a battery of, um, of lawyers, politicians and um, public uh, administrators happily occupied for a very long time. Uh, and you'll need expertise across the whole range of areas of law to which the EU has contributed um, uh, uh, over the last um, I was going to say over the last 43 years, but it's actually more than 43 years because, of course, when we went in in 1973, we um, inherited the um, EU law build-up since 1957. Right. So we're really talking about <clears throat> nearly 60 years, and it would be 60 years worth of EU law that would need to be unpicked and reviewed. Um, and then we'd need a massive legislative uh, operation, some of which might be done through Parliament, but some of it might be done um, through uh, subordinate legislation, um, to arrive at a situation where we had just so much EU law left with us as we wanted, perhaps converted into a new form. Um, and that would be an extremely interesting task but not a quick job. There's a lot of work ahead. A lot of work ahead, and it's very uncertain exactly where we'd end up. So I think, I think it is the uncertainty that's the biggest fact that needs to be borne in mind. Well, that's really extremely helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you.